uh, dear Ambassador Emerson, dear Professor Langhammer, uh, dear guests, uh, dear students, uh, I'm delighted to welcome you uh, today to the uh, Kiel Policy Lunch. And it's a special honor and privilege to welcome the new, or still relatively new, I should say, uh, U.S. Ambassador to Germany, His Excellency John B. Emerson uh, to the Hertie School. As uh, I'm sure many of you know, the previous uh, U.S. Ambassador, Phil Murphy, was a regular guest at the school. Indeed, he was one of our commencement speakers. And uh, we very much look forward to continuing the very, very close relationships we have had with the U.S. Embassy uh, also in, in the future. So I very much uh, hope, Your Excellency, that you will enjoy the time here at the school today. And we, I think, all look forward to a good um, debate later on about um, U.S.-European, U.S.-German relations along a number of topics. And the general topic for today is transatlantic renaissance, uh, United States, United States and Europe as indispensable allies in a changing world. So we take that as a statement that we want to explore in the next hour and a half. For those of you who have not been here to Hertie School, just let me say that we are a postgraduate institution and we try to prepare uh, students for leadership positions in government, business and civil society. And we are also a place that offers professionals who are already working in administration or in the business world. Uh, we offer them opportunities to deepen their skills and broaden their knowledge, primarily in the field of public management. And I think from the very, very beginning, the school emphasized the transatlantic element, the transatlantic relation. I think without the public policy schools in the United States, uh, we would not have the Hertie School uh, in Berlin. I think the uh, US, uh, in terms of governance and public policy, has always been at the forefront. And we were very, very grateful to learn from our institutions in the United States, uh, be it SEPA, uh, be it the Kennedy School, and, uh, and others, of how best to develop a school of governance, a school of public policy. Uh, in this part of the world. So we're very, very grateful. And the transatlantic element is also not only present in the curriculum of what we teach, uh, it is also there on a personal level. We have faculty members from the United States. We have students from the United States. So it is a very, very close uh, relationship. And um, many events uh, in recent months, years, days, uh, tell us how important that relationship is and how important it is that the US and Europe, the US and Germany as, as allies are somehow in sync when it comes to world affairs, for example, when it comes to trade policy, when it comes to security policy. And without going into any detail, you only have to look at the 1990s and what happened in the Balkans. You have to look at the last decade or in, into this decade uh, at the Arab Spring and what became for some um, a winter, an Arab winter, the terrible events in Syria and what is now unfolding in the Ukraine and in Russia uh, as exemplars where we always look for uh, the US and for the relationship the US has with its European allies in managing these relations. And I leave it to you to think about when and under what conditions those those relationships worked for the better and when there was a disagreement either in terms of strategy or, or tactics. So what is clear, however, is that uh, the US and Europe somehow need to join their diplomatic and other forces to prevent a return to the bad old days of the Cold War. And just as a little side note, we're beginning to celebrate in this city, as in many other parts, of Europe, 25 years of the fall of the Berlin Wall. And um, it seems a long time ago. And for those of us who have lived through the Cold War, it doesn't seem that long ago at all, because many of the things we're now experiencing seem awfully, awfully similar. So, but I'm digressing. I'm go already getting into the substance of what we are here to debate. So allow me uh, just to um, mention a few things about the background of our 
uh, of, of the ambassador and also of the other speaker today, Professor Langhammer. Um, ambassador Emerson is the uh, US amb uh, ambassador to, uh, of America to the United States and he's been there since August 2013. And previously he served as the president of the Capital Group Private Client Services in California. In 2010, P President Obama appointed Mr. Emerson to serve on the President's Advisory Committee for Trade Policy and Negotiations. And that, that's a continuity here, the trade scene, because in the early to mid-90s, Ambassador Emerson was Deputy Director of Presidential Personnel and subsequent Deputy Editor of Intergovernmental Affairs. And he worked on the trade uh, policy of the GATT under uh, President Clinton. So we, uh, we will hear from somebody who has a long standing experience in trade negotiations worldwide and also between the uh, North America and Europe. And before that, he served in various positions of government in LA. Uh, Professor uh, Ambassador Emerson has a, a BA uh, in uh, government and philosophy from Hamilton College and a G-Day from the University of Chicago. So that's our ambassador, and I'll give him the word in a moment. But before, I would like to introduce briefly the uh, second uh, person on the panel today. This is Professor Langhammer. He is the former vice president of the Kiel Institute and for many years was head of the Department of World uh, Economics there. Uh, he told me that for the last two years he has enjoyed the status of uh, Professor Emeritus and uh, has and continues to work on international trade policies and macroeconomic issues. And I think in the tradition of the Hertie Kiel Policy Lunch, this is a very, very good um, uh, event where we bring people together from different perspectives, but we come together on uh, shared interests in the substance of policy. In this case, it would be trade policy and macroeconomic issues between the United States and Europe. Uh, it, um, uh, one, one more word, because uh, you know the Kiel Institute is going to celebrate its 100th birthday this year. And I think that's a, a very, very fortunate event to celebrate. And I wish I could say the same for the Hertie School at, <laughs> at some point. But what we can say for the Hertie School that we are going to celebrate our 10th anniversary. So we have a lot of catching up to do, but it's, uh, it's absolutely splendid to know that such an institute has existed in this country for such a long period of time. Very good, well done indeed. Ambassador, the word is yours. Uh, Professor Anheyer, thank you so much for that uh, kind uh, introduction. And um, one thing you didn't mention that we just learned as we were walking in is that the professor and my brother, who has for years been a thought leader in the area of venture philanthropy or social entrepreneurship, uh, is um, I have long time working uh, relationship and have worked together for a great great amount of time. So it's good to be here and good to make that connection. I'd also like to introduce uh, uh, a couple of my uh, colleagues from the embassy, Tom Miller, who's the minister president of uh, public diplomacy, Katerina golner swede who is also uh, very involved in our cultural exchange efforts and, and all. So raise your hands, guys. We got a whole embassy team here. Uh, yeah, raise your hands. <laughs> okay, good. Anyway, um, it is a real ple pleasure to join with uh, students and faculty uh, of two such renowned institutions as the Heritage School of Governance and the Kiel Institute for the World Economy. And I want to congratulate uh, all of you who've played a role in the development of the Heritage School of Governance. You have not only become a major player here in Berlin and in Germany, but also uh, in the United States. Uh, my understanding is that you have uh, right now nine exchange partnerships with universities in the U.S., and uh, that's a number that's continuing to grow. And I also want to um, express a special welcome to my fellow Americans who are here uh, and participating in this program. Uh, you're going to love being in Berlin. Uh, and, well, my guess is some of you have been here longer than I have, but uh, I love being in Berlin, as you can tell. Um, 
And, uh, you know, you just uh, celebrated an important milestone, as I understand it, the 10th uh, uh, anniversary. But uh, as I understand it, the Keele Institute, uh, Professor Longheimer, is on the verge of celebrating its 100th birthday. Uh, the Keele Institute was uh, established as the Royal Institute for Marine Transportation and World Economy. I recently read, by the way, that in the past five years, the capacity for the world's container fleet has increased by 50%. So that work is obviously still extremely relevant. And uh, I'm sure that, uh, that you folks are, are on top of the dramatic changes that are happening uh, in the world around us, particularly as it result, relates to international trade. And that's something that we'll be talking about uh, here today. Uh, I would like to uh, spend most of my speech talking about the uh, Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership Agreement, which has enormous potential for our global economic health and prosperity, uh, and then talk a little bit, touch on some of the national security concerns that we share uh, between the United States and Germany that we're working on together, and hopefully that will also create some grist for the mill uh, in our discussion session afterwards. Um, but uh, TTIP, uh, as the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, quite a mouthful, is known, is, uh, is actually is vitally important. Uh, and given the strength of the trade and investment relationship between the United States and Europe, this agreement can bring significant benefits to people on both sides of the Atlantic and around the world. Nevertheless, and I'm a big believer in cutting to the chase, there is some uneasiness uh, that we've seen recently uh, expressed in the press about pursuing this new opportunity, and I'd like to address some of those concerns here today. First, one of the criticisms regarding the TTIP process is a perceived lack of transparency. On that issue, let me say that back in the United States, we actually have a pretty robust advisory system in place for trade agreements. Uh, you know, before an agreement can even get to the negotiating table, uh, we have, we pull together stakeholders from business, labor, NGOs, and scientific communities, as well as the general public, and give them an opportunity to weigh in on the objectives of that agreement. The Obama administration, in fact, has dramatically increased the diversity of the U.S. Trade Representatives Advisory System. Uh, in fact, I was, before I became ambassador, a member of the President's Trade uh, Advisory Panel. The administration has conducted unprecedented outreach through public sessions, at negotiations, and stakeholder sessions after each round of negotiations. The general philosophy is the more seats at the table, the more voices you have in the process, and the more buy-in you'll ultimately have to the agreement that's ultimately negotiated. And this week, after finishing the most recent round, I think the fourth round of the TTIP negotiations, uh, the trade, um, uh, trade team has spread out across Europe. Uh, in fact, the lead negotiator is here in Berlin today uh, to discuss TTIP. But I have heard complaints from parliamentarians and business people and others about a lack of transparency from the European side. Uh, a couple of comments on that. First of all, by the very nature of trade agreements or any kind of negotiation, even the legislative process, once negotiations start, there are parts of the discussion that cannot immediately go public. Otherwise, what happens is everybody just reverts to posturing and you don't get anything done. But it is absolutely obvious that we do need to do a better job at explaining our positions and educating people here in Europe in particular, but also in the United States about the progress of these negotiations. And one of the questions I would like to ask you students who are here to think about uh, particularly students of governance uh, who are in the room, is how can we better increase transparency and foster constructive dialogue while not reducing us to a point where everybody's just posturing the whole time because the Klieg lights are on and the TV cameras are there. It is uh, my impression, uh, second concern, that uh, both in the United States and in Europe, uh, people have expressed concern about TTIP 
based upon generalized perceptions regarding global trade. And some of the issues that have expressed are very similar to arguments that were raised 20 years ago during the negotiation of the Uruguay round of the GATT, uh, which was uh, my involvement, uh, the professor mentioned, in the Clinton White House. Uh, but frankly, there is today much more agreement, particularly between Europe and the United States, on environmental and labor concerns that dominated the GATT negotiations, which were a worldwide negotiation uh, even 20, uh, uh, 20 years ago. At the same time, the Clinton administration supported and promoted U.S. investment in developing countries. Many of those countries wanted that investment, not only because they wanted the dollars and the jobs that they created, but also because they, in fact, raise environmental and labor standards. Since then, thank to, thanks to effective trade agreements, in contrast to the feared effects of the Uruguay Round of the Gap that were expressed 20 years ago, a ceiling on working conditions, human rights, and environmental protections has not been put in place, quite the contrary. And there's a reason for that. And it can be summed up by one word, values. A commitment to a core set of common values that links transatlantic partners. Our shared vision for a more peaceful world is anchored in the history of our relationship. The extraordinary success that the United States and Europe have had together in the historic project of creating a Europe at peace, uh, whole, and free has made it possible to extend the promise of stability, security, and prosperity, and democracy to nations and peoples around the world. Obviously, recent events in Ukraine show us that there is much more work to do even 25 years after the fall of the wall and we will talk about that a little bit later. The work plan, though, if you think back to the post-war era, that we set for ourselves was in many ways defined by the Marshall Plan. That initiative was truly a joint European-American transatlantic venture. Its multilateral approach to problem solving was revolutionary at the time and that it required a new kind of economic and political cooperation European countries, having been through two major wars, were skeptical and cautious when Secretary of State George Marshall announced the plan in 1947. And the American people were also weary of war and certainly wary of new commitments. Intensive discussions took place on both sides of the Atlantic. And in the end, there was an agreement that the plan proposed by Secretary of State Marshall made imminent sense. In term, what does that have to do with today? Well, in terms of the ongoing TTIP negotiations, we need to be just as ambitious today as we were in 1947 and 1948 when the final plans for the economic recovery of Europe took shape. It is critical that we keep our eye not only on the goal of an ambitious and comprehensive agreement that makes our economy stronger but also an agreement that sets an example for the rest of the world. As U.S. Trade Rep Michael Froman has said last Friday, actually, at the end of the fourth round of TTIP negotiations, our interaction is helping to ensure that our trade policy is driven by the values that define and distinguish our economies and our societies. Those values include rule of law, respect for intellectual property, transaction in commercial dealing, and protection of workers and of our environment. These values are shared by the US and the EU, and if they are embedded in TTIP, they will serve as a touchstone for trade agreements elsewhere in the world. As an example, President Obama has made clear that all of our trade agreements must include fully enforceable labor standards, including a commitment to the freedom to form unions and bargain collectively, as well as guidelines regarding acceptable working conditions. Moreover, the Obama administration is committed to the enforcement of environmental laws, including implementing multilateral agreements such as 
the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species or issues such as illegal logging and wildlife trafficking. And finally, let's not forget, the impact of these agreements on consumers is substantial. Lower tariffs and lower or eliminated non-tariff barriers to trade result in lower prices and greater choices for consumers. Another priority is maintaining a free and open internet. And this has obviously been an issue that's been quite a subject of discussion, especially in the time that I've been here in Germany. This is at the center of our economic future. We need to address barriers to cross-border data flows to ensure the free flow of information to the benefit of consumers around the world. Balanced intellectual property protection includes copyright limitations and exceptions and safe harbors for internet providers. We also need to address new issues like cyber theft of trade secrets, as well as cyber attacks on our financial networks, air traffic control systems, and energy grids. And I tell you, if the NSA were to disappear tomorrow, these problems and these challenges would still exist. In order to take these on and other important challenges, we need to do more than simply replay the debates of the early 1990s. Trade and investment policies have got to catch up with advancements in technology, the rise of China, and a general reshaping of global commerce over the past quarter century. The world is changing at a pace we never would have predicted two decades ago. As I mentioned earlier, the capacity of the world's container fleet has grown by 50% within that same time period. The number of internet users has doubled from about 1.5 billion to 3 billion people. And the amount of internet traffic has tripled. The world's urban population, largely driven by shifts uh, population in Asia, the pool of workers entering the global economy has grown by 380 million people. That's much more than the entire population of the United States. Globalization is here to stay, and we become even broader and deeper. And the question is whether we're going to allow it to shape us or we're going to work to shape uh, uh, the process of globalization ourselves. Nevertheless, many people, and this is continues with the undercurrent of concern about TTIP, continue to focus on the disruptive effect that globalization has undoubtedly had on national economies. For instance, on both sides of the Atlantic, imports may have initially, may have, they did, initially displaced some workers as manufacturing migrated abroad. But the fact is new sources of trade have created jobs in poorer and developing countries, which in turn has furthered political liberal, uh, liberalization in some places, moderated global inflation, and in fact become a very powerful force for alleviating poverty and raising living standards around the world, the end result being creating new markets for export nations like Germany and the United States to sell their goods. And beyond that, it has provided, globalization has provided key new supply sources for goods used by American and European manufacturers. And I believe, uh, Professor Longhammer, that you will agree that a central question in any discussion of TTIP has got to be, as transatlantic partners, how can we best work with rising powers in emerging growth markets? The more united, integrated, interconnected, and dynamic the international liberal economic order is, the greater the likelihood that emerging powers will rise within this order and adhere to its rules. The looser or weaker those bonds are, the greater likelihood that rising powers will challenge this order. Or put another way, a lot of the problems that we face in the world today are thematically driven by this struggle between modernization on the one hand and traditionalism on the other hand. And one of the biggest challenges we have is angry young people in the streets who don't have a job and don't see a future. And the more we can help to create shared prosperity through, through le unleashing the benefits of globalization, 
People have shared prosperity. They've got jobs. They're less likely to be angry. They're less likely to turn to extremism as a way to find value in their lives. In this globalized world, we have a choice. We can either ignore the realities that surround us or navigate it through agreements that build stronger intellectual property, labor, environmental rules, and put other regulations into the global trading system. That's why I say that TTIP could establish a strategic, a political, and an economic foundation that will be as important to creating shared prosperity of the 21st century as NATO was to creating the shared security that was the hallmark of the 20, uh, second half of the 20th century. Let's talk about another concern, small and medium-sized businesses and trade. I've heard uh, concerns expressed that, well, they, they're left out of the TTIP agreement. It's all just to, to help big businesses. Well, think about it. New patterns of production based on complex cross-border value chains are a major element of US-EU economic ties. Today's goods, ranging from large planes to electronic devices that we all have in our pockets, I guess I don't, I have to lock mine up when I go into my office, by the way, um, are made up of intermediate products, both tangible, such as cases or wings or wheels, and intangible, such as design or computer programming software. These different elements are made by multiple businesses and brought around the world and brought together into a final product through a global value change. You know, uh, Germans love to talk about made in Germany. Americans love to talk about made in America. But increasingly, whether we're buying something from a German company or an American company, it's actually made in the world. Take the iPhone. It's, a well, it's well known that Apple assembles their smartphone in China. But the profits are shared among a number of countries. In 2010, an iPhone cost just over $187 US at the factory gate. Korea contributed $80 worth of components to that total. Good for Korea. Chinese Taipei, $21. The US, $23. Germany, just over $16. And by putting all the parts and components together, yes, it was assembled in China, but Chinese workers contributed $6.50 to each iPhone. Now that equation can change, and it can change quickly. But one thing is certain, what counts for success in today's world is not so much where the final goods are produced, but where the value is added along the chain of production. And the more sales, of final products of consumers, uh, I'm sorry, of final products to consumers of those products, and given the reduction of prices and the increase in choices that'll result from trade agreements, you're gonna have more products being sold. The greater the benefit to the small and medium-sized businesses who contribute the components to those products. There's also an enormous revolution underway in how we market to an unprecedented extent Online platforms now enable individuals and firms to connect across cultural and national borders without spending the time and money to create distribution networks. Small and micro enterprises are able to complement their traditionally locally focused retail skills with the latest technologies, allowing them to access global markets with lower entry barriers. These small businesses are flourishing so much so that um, you know we almost uh, they're almost more multinational than many multinational companies. So we've got to be very very careful when we think about the internet and this whole conversation about what we need to do, which is an important conversation to better protect data privacy. Let's make sure that in the rush to address data privacy, we don't undermine these opportunities for small and medium businesses, and particularly for the startup world, uh, through the doctrine of unintended consequences. Let me raise another concern. Bilateral flows between the US and the EU in research, development, and innovation are more intense than between any two other international partners. And they're essential to leading edge sectors such as semiconductors, biotech, and nanotechnology. 
They, in turn, have the potential to deliver hugely significant economic benefits across the entire economy, just as electricity and computers and, and mobile phones have done in the past. Our prosperity depends on continued high levels of innovation in our respective societies, as well as on the strength of our knowledge links to one another and to the global hubs of innovation and ideas. But here, too, there are broader questions that are asked. As we see innovations and we react to them, we've got to make sure both in technology, uh, and, and this also applies to technology and agriculture, that we're asking the question, are we giving science its proper value when it comes to making political decisions? Conversation uh, that I had with some very senior people in the German government recently focused on the fact that you have policymakers making decisions about technology that they don't really understand. And I certainly don't understand it. But we need to, if we're going to do this, we need to involve practitioners and engineers and people who really understand what, we, what we're dealing with in those, uh, uh, in those discussions. And, uh, and, and finally, on the, on the whole TTIP question, uh, I'd like to address the um, non-tariff trade barriers or standards that uh, TTIP is trying to address. The burden of standards is carried most heavily by small and medium-sized business. And I, and I already talked about how we both, EU and the US, have some of the highest standards uh, in the world. Uh, but big companies can afford to employ specialists who deal with regulatory differences, you know, duplicative testing, that kind of thing. Smaller businesses will benefit from regulatory convergence uh, of standards uh, by saving money on duplicative testing, legal analyses, and conformity, uh, uh, conformity uh, in assessments. So uh, in any event, I hope you'll keep in mind as you are engaged in discussions about the pros and cons of TTIP, some of these uh, kind of real world responses to some of the concerns and objections that have been raised. What I'd like to do is, uh, is just um, uh, close by touching on uh, not just the economic side of our transatlantic relationship, but also the important national security partnership that we enjoy with Germany. And again, hopefully this will give us uh, some good grist for the mill for our discussion session afterwards. Now, last month I was in Washington, D.C. for meetings between the Secretary of State, John Kerry, and uh, Ausen Minister uh, Frank Walter Steinmeier. The discussion was uh, candid and it was constructive. The underlying theme was how we can deepen our cooperation but also continue to move beyond some of the recent tensions that have arisen. Not ignoring those tensions, but to continue to move beyond. And the Secretary of State and, uh, and Foreign Minister Steinmeier discussed steps to strengthen our intelligence cooperation and to address the balance between Sicherheit und Freiheit. And that is part of an ongoing conversation. They also, however, discussed the whole range of our shared efforts to promote peace and stability around the world. The United States welcomes Germany's growing role in addressing the urgent and pressing global challenges that we face. Here are some examples. We deeply appreciate and value Germany's support in Afghanistan, where Germany's ISAF contributions have been essential, along with the commitment to a post-2014 NATO mission and their financial support for the Afghan security forces. In that regard, I traveled to Mazar-e-Sharif with General Fritz, who's the leading uh, uh, German military commander uh, just three weeks ago, to visit with the uh, German troops and the American troops and, and to be briefed on the issues there. We also value Germany's commitment and work together closely on, in trying to resolve the situation in the Middle East, and in particular, the support that Germany is giving to the Middle East peace process and our combined efforts to help bring about a final status agreement, as well as our partnership in working to ensure that Iran does not ever develop nuclear weapons. We are working closely with Germany and value Germany's increasing international pressure 
on the Assad regime to bring about an end to this long and horrific war in Syria and to assist in the destruction of the chemical weapons that were discovered that, uh, that are being destroyed uh, from that country. And as I mentioned earlier, at this moment in time, the Ukraine is at the forefront of our minds. Ukraine is facing a moment of historic challenge and hopefully historic opportunity. Chancellor Merkel and Foreign Minister Steinmeier have shown extraordinary leadership. They've probably spoken with President Obama and Secretary Kerry more times in the last three weeks than they had in the previous uh, year. This is a shared burden. Both Germany and the United States stand for a set of universal rights and values and fundamental freedoms. This certainly applies to the Ukraine, where the people should be free to choose which path their country should take. We are looking together for a responsible way to meet the needs of all the parties, but to do so in a manner that respects the freedom and sovereignty of the territorial integrity of Ukraine. And that includes calling on Russia to work with us in order to rebuild unity, security, and a healthy economy in the Ukraine. The US, like Germany, also continues to aspire to a Europe that is whole, free, and at peace. The decades of work that we've invested in the Euro-Atlantic institutions and transatlantic relations are testament to that. And we will continue to work closely together as well for not only that, but for our vision of shared prosperity in the 21st century. Now is the time for a new era of US-EU cooperation, a renaissance, as Secretary Kerry says, of the vision and common values that define our partnership. The Marshall Plan fired the political, business, and popular imagination of its time. The challenges for our times require us to reinvigorate that spirit of cooperation and collaboration in order to forge a more strategic and relevant 21st century transatlantic partnership, a partnership that can not only respond effectively to the tremendous changes all about us, but can also help to create that era of shared prosperity. Thank you very much.